ready. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, this is our final webinar for the course, Caring for Audiovisual Material. And we really have a fantastic webinar planned for you today. It looks like right now we have about 154 people logged into this meeting room. And feel free to continue saying hello in that chat box. And throughout the webinar, feel free to post all your questions in there as well. And we'll try to get to them all by the end of uh, our session today. As you know, this is just one course in our seri series, Caring for Yesterday's Treasures Today. Six courses have already concluded um, and are available on our website to go back to at any time. Um, and recordings to this course will also be posted there shortly. These courses, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say they would not have been possible without uh, our, the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program Grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So an, a huge thank you to IMLS for supporting training opportunities like this. And we're also fortunate to have Mike on board with us uh, with Learning Times to help us with both the website and webinar support. And for this particular course, uh, we also owe a great debt to the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts for organizing all of our speakers and materials. And Laura is on board with us again today to help field all your questions. Laura, do you want to say a quick hello? Sure. Thanks, Jenny. Again, my name is Laura Hort Stanton. I'm the Director of Preservation Services at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. And we are a nonprofit regional conservation center based in Philadelphia. And we specialize in paper-based materials, but do also have some experience with audiovisual materials. So that's why it's been great to be able to work with Heritage Preservation on this series. So thank you. Thank you. So before we move on to our topic today, uh, let me just quickly review what you can expect following the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, to officially complete this course, we just asked for a few things. The first is that you've registered, so you're in our system. Uh, we ask that you watch all five of the webinars in the course, whether you're showing up live or you're watching the recordings. And finally, we also ask that you complete all five homework assignments. All of these assignments are due one week from today on November 6th, so Wednesday, November 6th. So we have had to make a few adjustments to the way we award our certificate of completion. Uh, when we began that the courses, we had absolutely no idea how many people would go, would not only go through the effort of watching these webinars, but also completing all of those homework assignments. On average, we have about 300 people finish each course. And as you might imagine, we are very close to hitting our ceiling on our postage budget. So in an effort to help reduce cost of postage and printing, we are going to ask you to help us uh, just a little bit. Uh, for those of you who complete the course, you will receive an email notification that includes your name, number of instruction hours, and other pertinent information about the course. And this will, in essence, serve as your certificate and proof of your achievement. And as always, you will receive a digital credential from Credly.com. Uh, we hope that this is a satisfactory alternative and that you understand why it's necessary. Uh, but with that, I will say we do know that that 8.5 by 5.5 piece of paper um, has become important to some of you. Um, and we want to do our best to accommodate those folks um, who have found it really important. Uh, so there are two additional options. Uh, we can email you an image of your certificate uh, that you can print yourself. Or if absolutely necessary, we can uh, print it and mail it to you like we do have done in the past. In uh, today's homework assignment, uh, you'll notice that the second question after your contact information uh, will be a spot to denote how you want to receive your certificate. So uh, make sure to fill that out to let us know. Um, as in course past, the final assignment is actually the evaluation. We really look forward to hearing your feedback. Um, and if you feel more comfortable doing so anonymously, you'll notice at the end of this uh, evaluation there is an opportunity to provide anonymous feedback. And if you're not interested in earning uh, or completing the course officially, um, which means you haven't been doing the homework assignment, um, I'm going to ask you if you could please still do that last assignment um, and fill out that uh, evaluation, because that would be incredibly helpful to us. The course web page, it will remain up and continue to hold all of those presentation resources, transcripts. And after the sixth the day your homework is due, the course will have officially concluded and will start the process of posting the uh, webinar recordings to that page so you can share with your colleagues or go back and look at everything that you've gone through already. 
So what's next? Shortly following this webinar, we will send you an email with links to all the webinar recordings so that we hope will happen today. Um, it will include recordings and links to homework assignments, so you'll have everything in one place. Again, all the materials are due November 6th, one week from today. And shortly following that deadline, we'll pull down all the links to the homework assignments and replace them with recordings uh, of the webinars on the course webpage. Staff at Heritage Preservation will then begin the process of logging all your homework assignments and tracking attendance. Uh, once we have that logged, usually it takes about a week, uh, we will send you an email notification and online credentials from Kelly.com. Then if you haven't done so already, consider signing up to become a member of the online community. Membership is free and does give you access to posting on the discussion board, which is a great way to continue some of these conversations. And as always, if you have questions, please feel free to email us or call us. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to our topic. I am pleased to introduce today's instructor, Stephanie Rennie. Stephanie is an archivist and audiovisual specialist at George Blood Audio and Video. She has worked in a variety of academic and public libraries, archives, and non-traditional library settings around the globe. Her accomplish accomplishments and experiences are extensive including the management of the Arms Control Disarmament and International Security Library at the University of Illinois, aiding in the development of LibraryThing.com, and independently managing the Pacific Basin Institute Archive at Pomona College in Claremont, California, where she was also responsible for building a new on-campus facility. Stephanie, I know I'm missing a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and uh, move this out of the way and hand things over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I am happy to be here and uh, happy to see so many people from all over the globe. So welcome. Um, I, like I said, I work at George Blood Audio and Video. Uh, we do digitization reformatting of music, film, uh, video collections uh, for libraries and archives all over the globe. Uh, and today I just wanted to talk to you guys about uh, understanding reformatting options and providing access to your collections. Um, I was just going to begin with a bit of an overview of the uh, audio digitization workflow process here. Um, as you can see by the graph, uh, this is just kind of a visual representation of uh, the digitization process uh, that we go through here at the studio. Um, I'm mainly just going to cover details of audio in this course, given the time frame. Uh, but video is just as extensive and complex, and I'd be happy to uh, be a resource in the future uh, for questions pertaining to that as well. Um, so I'm going to go through the particularities of audio digitization in practice, uh, covering the standards, including many metadata standards. And um, right now, I think probably most of you are dealing with collections uh, that you're trying to figure out what tools to use, um, and also kind of what happens during the digitization process. Uh, so I just want to provide an overview for you. So when we receive and process materials, uh, there are three different types of files that can be created to make up a digital archival set. They consist of the preservation master, uh, the use and access copy, and the web accessible copy. Um, all of these depend on the situation of your institution and your wants and needs for the project. Um, but we'll begin first by looking at a preservation master. So a preservation master is the most important file uh, to manage. And as such, it should be rarely accessed. It's meant um, kind of to provide a copy of the original, but in digital form. Uh, it refers, uh, it typically, um, excuse me, the standard <coughs> is 96 kilohertz and, or 24 bits, which refers to the, <coughs> excuse me, bit rate and bit depth and sample rate for an audio file. Um, sometimes that is done in 44.1, 16-bit. But you can think of kilohertz as referring to, as to the pulse code modulation in an audio file. 
um, which is the digital representation of sample analog signals. So you can compare this to the DPI of a TIFF file. Uh, bits measure the volume or the amplitude, and it's similar to how a TIFF file would document its range of colors. Um, preservation masters are usually processed as a wave or broadcast wave format, uh, and I'll be discussing the broadcast wave uh, later in the course. So the key advantages of a preservation master, um, you know, we process it into a broadcast wave format, which is the most widely used format. Uh, it has a higher resolution than 99% of sources, and it's a file format for audio data. It adheres to the EPU, or European Broadcasting Union, technical recommendations and standards. Um, it's better than most playback chains, and derivatives can be easily created from this file. Uh, so if you can think of it like a sound TIFF, uh, it's kind of a way to uh, visualize what a B wave file is in, in the field of audio. Um, so the preservation master comes with some difficulties as well. Um, it's, there's no standard storage medium. The data types are often expensive to maintain uh, because the files are larger, so they're too big to house on a CD-ROM. Uh, online storage it requires ongoing maintenance, and um, internet delivery is often impractical for this type of file. Uh, it's just too large. Um, the advantages of having a preservation master over its derivatives is that it will provide you uh, with a basis um, that you can use your files. So a typical solution that we provide for some of these problems uh, is that we'll give a 9624 hard drive to a digital library. Um, which is, uh, requires enterprise-level storage. Um, often, you might need IT staff to help with that. Um, 9624 can be put on DVD-ROM. And from there, it can be migrated to hard drive when available. Or you can also uh, put it on a gold CDR. Um, if it's small enough, you can put it on a CD-ROM or an LTO3 data tape to uh, keep it long term. So a main derivative of the preservation master is the use and access copy. Uh, the key traits this, uh, of a use and access copy um, are that it's readily accessible uh, in a user-friendly format. So often we'll make CDs or DVDs to have on shelf in the library. Um, it's good enough to substitute if you lose the preservation master, uh, but an important element to remember is that once you're pulling a derivative from a preservation master file, uh, you lose some of the information in the file. Um, sound, it's often information that you can't necessarily hear uh, to the human ear, but uh, because it's pulled from a larger file, uh, it doesn't have the same breadth and depth to the sound. So some key difficulties of a use and access copy is that um, you know we'll look at CD audio versus CD-ROM. Um, now, both of these mediums are not can't last long term um, because they will deteriorate in some form. It is a CD. Uh, but a CDDA is a, a digital audio CD. It has a pure serial read, so you can't reread it to correct errors, um, even small transient errors. Uh, whereas a CD-ROM is more sector-based, it's digital audio provided as data. 
Um, so it can be reread. It's a bit more reliable, but it requires computers, software, particular OS system to retrieve the information. Uh, so CDDAs are more widely playable, uh, but CD-ROMs are more reliably played. So depending somewhat on the preservation master file, uh, use and access copy will be provided on a CDDA for near universal playability. Um, in video form, we provide it on a DVD. Um, and it's always important to have multiple copies. Uh, you could put one copy on a gold CDDA or one on a green. Um, these are different standards of a CD. Um, often, we'll put the Preservation Master on a CDR, or excuse me, a gold CDR. Um, and the user and access copy on a green uh, gold CDR is just a bit of a higher quality. So our third uh, format of file is the web accessible copy. Uh, it depends on the rights um, of whether or not you're able to stream this material. Uh, RA and AAC on the, you'll see on the PowerPoint here, um, RA refers to real audio, which is a streaming format. AAC is the advanced audio coding file, uh, which is a standardized lossy compression scheme for digital audio uh, that was designed to be the successor of MP3 as part of uh, MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 specifications. Um, uh, MP3 is used as a web accessible copy or WMA. Um, but you know, to have uh, real audio RA or AAC, um, you have to have access uh, to those rights. Um, it depends on your needs. Uh, you might have restrictions to put things online um, beyond your institutional ability. Uh, but sometimes you want to. Uh, give further access to your material, and a web accessible copy can provide that. Um, it, it won't be quite the same standard of sound as you would get as a, in a preservation master or um, a user access copy, but um, it can still provide a different resource to your material. Um, a lot of, uh, one of the benefits, I think, of a web accessible copy is uh, the accessibility um, obviously says it in the name, but uh, that's a large part of preservation um, is just access to materials. Um, oops, I think I accidentally uh, pressed something here that confused my screen. Sorry. No worries, let me... Oh, oh there we go. All right. Apologies. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> there it is. All right. Um, so just kind of to summarize, uh, you know, uh, preservation masters used to be provided on analog, um, processed uh, from, you know, to a further format um, more as things were developed. Um, but now, since we're in the digital realm, uh, we stick with 9624 preservation master file, um, which can then be moved to uh, DVD, ROM, uh, hard drive for storage, or an LTO data tape. Um, a CDR, you know, it can be then made into a CDDA or CD-ROM in either gold or green. Uh, it depends on your choice. Um, and the resources that you have uh, to give to your collection. But ultimately, um, it stands to point out that uh, digital is not forever. Um, it's the idea of uh, preservation is often thought of as the caretaking of old archival material found in someone's dark attic that has to re be retrieved from a back room. But the practice of digital preservation is more largely understood in the field as that of providing access to information as well as history. 
the American Library Association uh, PARS definition uh, of digital preservation, and PARS is the uh, is a uh, cohort of the American Library Association that specializes in uh, preservation. I think I provided um, a link to their website. Uh, at the end of the course, or on the resources page, I believe. Um, it's a preservation and reformatting section. Uh, they state that digital preservation combines policies, strategies, and actions to ensure access to reformatted and born digital content regardless of the challenges of media failure and technological change. The goal of digital preservation is the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time. So the accurate rendering of authenticated content over time. So this leads us to look at preservation in terms of access to the content versus that of the medium. Uh, so audiovisual media deteriorates rapidly. Playback machines for most, if not all, analog material have become obsolete. Uh, analog is widely considered to be dead. Uh, digital, though, is not considered to be forever. And as a result, we need to be conscious of the constant change and challenges that face the practice of digital preservation. Uh, this uncertainty principle considers and values the idea of access to information documented, whether expected or unexpected, in recordings. So. The catch is regardless of the challenges of media failure and technical change. So this makes digital, therefore, makes migration a way of life. Um, so what do we consider when discussing migration? How frequent? How long will your materials last? Um, what determines when you should migrate. Uh, often that's due to format obsolescence, um, which can't be as big of a problem as we know how to move forward in uh, formats. But carrier obsolescence uh, is a really big problem if you can't find anything to play your files on. Uh, then there's no way for you to listen to it. So what then is obsolescence? Uh, consider a CDR versus an LTO tape. Uh, a CDR you know, is a good option for a user access copy, uh, but it comes into use in somebody's hands often. Um, an LTO tape is uh, something that can last a little longer, but it, you need some IT support. Um, you know, we term that as enterprise level storage. Um, it boils down to the ability that your institution has um, to support your media and also the limitations. Um, can you handle having an I2 level storage or are you dealing with a bunch of drives on a shelf? So the term uh, bunch of drives on a shelf was coined by Andy Clovis at the Vermont Folklife Center. Um, you know, it's cheap and fast and familiar. We can all uh, use a hard drive. But the issue with uh, hard drives is they die easily and they're easily erased. Um, an LTO tape is has high density, high resolution, um, but it's IT intensive, has short life styles, and a complex machine dependency. Uh, so you'll often need uh, an IT support staff to help with the backups of LTO tape. Uh, CDs are, are cheapish and widely available with mid-resolution, but there's lots of handling to migrate, and uh, the metadata there's is none except for the label. Um, on an enterprise class hard drive, it's a, it's a fast preferred solution, but it needs technical staff and can often be expensive. Um, this is a you know large server type hard drive that uh, you could use for backup of your materials. So what does all of this say? Well, IT is getting even cheaper ever more quickly. Um, it also gets obsolete. 
So over multiple migrations, you have to plan ahead uh, for the life cycle cost. Um, what ability will your institution have at any given future time to support the migration of digital content? Uh, because the decisions you make today are governed by that future ability. This is an important point. Um, if you can't support the migration choices you make now further down the road, uh, then you're unable to support the continued digital preservation of your material. Um, so I think before I go into uh, a standard section, um, it looks like we have a few questions that I'll try to answer for you guys um, if there's any confusion. Um. Yeah, I, hi Stephanie, this is Laura. Um, there does appear to be a few questions and I think a lot of it is um, due to like in any field all of the acronyms <laughs> that end up um, floating around. Um, so when you were, some of the questions related to that more just terminology, one was when you were talking about the preservation master, you mentioned PCM. And what does that stand for? Oh, uh, PCM is, stands for Pulse, Pulse Code Modulation. Um, it's essentially the digital representation of sampled analog symbols. Uh, so it's the way that if you would look at a wave symbol, um, picture a wave symbol for an audio signal, uh, the ups and the downs, that is a pulse code modulation of that audio signal. Okay. And so other questions in that same vein. Um, some folks wanted to know, and I know Jenny did a little bit explanation in the chat box, but what actually is LTO? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> LTO is a linear tape open. Uh, it's actually a magnetic tape data storage technology. It was uh, developed in the 90s, um, and it was an alternative to proprietary formats. Um, it's used as, uh, especially for backup. Uh, for it, with, we, we use it to backup our files. Um, essentially, we have things housed on the server, and then we'll back it up to LTO tape. It's a reliable uh, backup option. Great. Um, we also had some questions about, um, you were also mentioning with the Preservation Master, the term 9624, and people were looking for a little bit more clarification there as well. Oh, sure. Um, 9624 is the sample rate and bit depth uh, referred to in an audio file. Um, the sample rate is essentially um, is essentially the frequency. It uh, defines the number of samples per unit of time taken from a con an audio signal, a continuous sample. Uh, so the sample rate is um, the frequency. Uh, bit depth that refers to uh, it is a part, I mean, both of these elements are part of, of pulse code modulation uh, that I mentioned before, um, but it's the number of bits of information in each sample. So it corresponds to uh, the resolution of each sample. Um, so there's 16, or in this case, this is 24 bits per sample, um, if that clears that up a little more, I hope. Yeah. Um, a few more questions for you, and then we'll let you get started with it again. Um, but one question was, um, how do you convert other formats to the WAVE file? So um, the person was asking, you know, how do you convert, for, for example, WMA to a WAVE format? If there's uh, an easy explanation for that. <laughs> uh, um, I guess I, generally our transfer engineers would be uh, doing that process. Um, you would use a converter, uh, a particular um, 
computer program that would convert the WMA to the wave. Um, it's similar to how from analog to digital, you have a analog to digital converter with essentially a machine that you plug in that connects the analog to the digital. Um, it's something that makes the files talk to each other. Um, so I'm not positive. I think there, there are various sources that you can use for that process. Um, I'm not positive all the ones that we use in the studio here. Um, okay. Fair enough. But knowing that there's tools out there that you can, can use to be able to do that, I think, is, is helpful to people. Um, and I lied. I do have one more, more question for you. Is that you were talking about you know, your, your access copy, your use copy, and of course your preservation master. And um, the question that we had is when you're doing your migration or conversion, um, which copy would you use in the future? Um, is that why you're making the preservation copy as well? Uh, yeah, I mean the preservation master copy would serve as the go-to copy. Um, essentially, use and access copies and web copies uh, are made to provide access. Um, so the preservation master copy is is a similar thing to um, taking your film and putting it in a freezer to preserve it. Um, it's not a copy that you want to be using. Uh, that's what you make the use and access copies for. Um, they develop as derivatives of the preservation master. Uh, so the preservation master aims to be the closest to the um, original. The idea of it is to provide a digital representation of the analog signal um, as close as possible to its original. Well, we have lots more questions, but um, we'll get, we're going to go ahead and hold those till you're ready to take a, another break, I think. OK, great. Um, well, I guess we'll just move on to uh, highlighting some of the standards. Um, I realize that uh, probably throwing quite a few um, terms your way and uh, seeming to gloss over some things, it's uh, some uh, standards and ideas that are a little difficult to explain in just a couple minutes. Um, but as an introduction, um, you know, I hope this can provide you as, uh, with uh, resources uh, and a way to begin uh, looking into how to process material. Um, we also welcome questions or calls um, to the uh, studio, uh, happy to be a resource uh, in the future. Um, but in looking to the practice of digital preservation, there are some important standards uh, that include uh, B-Wave files, as I mentioned before, um, which is a broadcast wave that we use for the preservation master. Uh, there is uh, BEXT and info chunks that are uh, part of the metadata process um, within a B-Wave file, ID3 tags, which are also uh, referred to metadata. Um, there's an AES 57 guidelines, which is the Audio Engineering Society guidelines. These are all things I will be going through in depth um, as much as I can, uh, and PB core, and then checksums, which provide data integrity. Um, so just to kind of launch in. Um, so the B wave uh, is a derivative of the wave file. It's a broadcast wave. Um, it was released in 1992 as part of Windows 3.1 uh, as part of the RIS standard, uh, which is a Microsoft resource interchange file um, that also had derivatives of, you've probably heard of AD AVI files. Um, uh, or they're probably the most common on this list, um, in addition to RMI and RDI. Um, so uh, the B wave is what uh, we use in final automation at George Blood Audio and Video. Um, 
all of our files are created from a single original capture file. Uh, that specific file info is then gathered from a FileMaker Pro database, uh, which is where we house the metadata. Uh, and then there, we use uh, Linux command line auto utilities uh, to uh, uh, excuse me to read the information. Um, so the original file is. Uh, split into these three different types of a preservation master access copy or web copy. The specifics of those um, that I briefly mentioned before, the preservation master is often processed as a wave um, and is provided in 96 kilohertz, 24 bits with BEXT met metadata attached to it um, that's housed within the file. Uh, an access copy is often uh, processed into a wave, but at a lower pulse code modulation, which is at 44 1 kilohertz and 16 bits. Um, and that's provided for CD burning most often. Uh, the web copy is an MP3 um, at 192 kilobits per second. Uh, and there is an ID3 metadata tagged on to that. So um, some of the audio utilities that we use uh, in the digitization process include uh, SOX, which is sound exchange. It's considered uh, termed as the Swiss army knife of sound processing. Um, it's, it's used for sample rate and format conversion. Uh, so uh, most likely this could be something that would be used in the WMA to waive uh, the question that was asked earlier, uh, conversion. Um, and then there's the Libsyn file, which is a, a C library language. Um, it contains an example of a program that gives a lot of useful info about the files um, with BEXT embedding. You can check that out at um, meganerd.com. Um, I provided these links on the resource page as well. Um, they're open source. Uh, programs that you are able to uh, download. So uh, B-Wave file consists of two mandatory wave chunks. Uh, the FMT chunk, it describes the contents of a wave file. Um, this is speaking to the metadata uh, the BEX chunks that are attached to a B-Wave file. Um, the format uh, chunk, it includes uh, descriptions of the format, the number of channels, whether it's mono or stereo, uh, the sample rate and bit depth, which are 9624, as I referred to before, um, and the streaming info. Uh, the data then uh, covers the audio data, which uh, is there's no compression. Um, there, there are many other things that you can include in the audio data portion. Um, Multi-channel format, 64-bit audio. Um, it's a place where uh, your wave, the pulse code modulation, um, is documented in the file. Um, So there's also uh, an optional list of wave chunks or info chunks that can be embedded in a B-Wave file. Um, this includes information uh, on the list you see here. Um, any new info field can be defined, but um, an application shouldn't ignore any chunk it doesn't understand. So there are common registered info fields like an artist, comments, copyright, genre, name. Um, some examples uh, of these optional uh, items that you can include in your BEX chunk. So additionally, there is the sample chunk or the sampler chunk, uh, SMPL, which defines the basic parameters that an instrument 
such as a MIDI sampler could use to play the waveform data. Uh, it includes info about looping the waveform during playback. Uh, it's useful when data is used in samplers, but it rarely holds value in the preservation world. Um, but Peak Audio is uh, one of the software programs that we use, uh, and it inserts a sample chunk in every wave file it saves. Um, so it's just included as part of that particular program. Um, there's other optional wave chunks uh, that uh, a pad or junk chunk, which is really just a placeholder chunk. Um, these are less common and are used to align files of different sizes for easier conversion. Um, it allows a quick expansion of any other header chunks and a program called WaveLab is one that we use. It inserts pad chunks in all saved wave files. So um, I lost my screen again. One of the most important elements of the B-Wave um, is the BEX chunk, which is a mandatory part. Uh, it defines the metadata fields um, and holds a controlled and suggested vocabulary for most fields. So um, that includes the description, the originator, the originator reference, uh, origination date, origination time, time reference, and coding history. Um, it limits the data chunk to pulse code modulation or MPEG formats, um, both of which you, I, I mentioned pulse code modulation before. Um, MPEG I can go over in a little bit. Uh, so here's an example of a BEX chunk that we would show in an audio file. Uh, the description at the top uh, with the uh, name and the uh, song that is played, uh, the originator, which is where it came from, the origination reference, um, which is uh, the client, uh, the date and time. Uh, and then at the bottom is the coding history. Um, so you can see uh, at the beginning um, there's a PCM, which is the pulse code modulation here, uh, and then 9624, the bit and sample rate. Here's We document uh, whether we process it in stereo, dual mono, the uh, machine that's used, um, and the programs that are used as uh, in conversion. Um, So moving on, um, obviously B-Wave is a surrogate of the WAV file, um, but um, there are some problems with normal WAV files, which is partly why B-Wave is created. Um, they have proprietary chunks, uh, which means, uh, for example, Peak uh, is one of the only apps that would read the WAV chunk. Um, a lot of the info is redundant. Um, these older applications don't always ignore uh, the superfluous chunks like the info chunk or the uh, junk chunk that I mentioned before. So um, efforts should be taken to write the most basic WAV file because uh, the simpler it is, the more interoperable it will be. So there are some programs that exist to strip extraneous chunks from your WAV files uh, after conversion. Uh, WAV Trim is a Windows application that removes superfluous chunks from WAV files. And uh, SOX is a command line application that uh, does many audio ut utilities. Um, you can download that from sourceforge.net. Uh, which is a great resource. Um, I also see some conversations about BWF meta edit. Um, that is, you can download that from sourceforge.net as well. Um, 
we use uh, BWF MetaEdit uh, in our quality assurance um, after a file is processed. Uh, we look at the um, metadata that from the original to the converted file and compare between the two. So a WAV file, um, it has a lack of WAV format extensible support. Uh, there's, it was part, there was a Windows 2000 update to the spec that supported higher sampling rates and greater bit depths um, with multiple channel greater than stereo audio. So it's just, um, it's best to avoid it if you can. Um, it's difficult to support it um, down the road. B-Wave, um, there is some problems in the impl implementation of it. There are a uh, few commercial software titles that read Bex chunk info and few pro audio applications that embed the metadata. Uh, for example, uh, Peak 6, Adobe Audition, and WaveLab are some examples of uh, professional audio applications. Um, but if you look at Peak 5, the old version, um, or Audacity, um, they can't embed uh, the same type of metadata um, that is held in the Bex chunk. So um, B-Wave is mostly geared toward broadcast applications and has some limits for info preservationists. Um, honestly, and it's just best to keep it simple. Um, avoid extensible formats and know your software. Um, stick with similar versions. Um, so I don't know if I should maybe pause again for a few questions. It looks like um, there are yeah. some large questions over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be great to kind of address um, some of the questions. Again, um, some are more technical, and while others are, you know, of the more more general sorts of questions. Um, someone had Andrew from Rock Hill, South Carolina, had asked. Do you think that there's any alternative to the WAV files for storing audio since they're just so huge? Um, and are you familiar with, and I know I'm just going to say it, FLAC or FLAC file format? Um, and would you be able to comment on that? Sure. Um, I mean, as far as uh, Preservation Master, it's really, we'd recommend a WAV given um, the amount of sonic information that is covered. Um, I think that it's probably best to, if you don't have as much space, um, you know, that's what we provide use and access copies for. Um, but uh, storage is becoming a lot more cheaper, um, hard drives and the like. So um, it's actually not extremely difficult um, to store your files uh, when they're in WAV format. Um, I think part of it is uh, prioritizing uh, what you're preserving. Okay. Well, some people, I think, um, their heads are spinning a little bit with all this information because it is a ton of information. And I guess I'm wondering, and also a few other people were wondering, so say that they don't feel comfortable using one of these converters or um, they might not have access to it for one reason or another. So um, some people have asked, if they can't convert things to WAV files, is it something so important that they should send this out to a vendor to do right away? Or is it something that as long as they're storing what they've got, okay, are they, are they safe? Should they worry? Um, yeah, I mean, at the, at the very least, uh, you know, stick to um, standards that you know in the field, um, you know, keeping things in a cool, dry environment uh, with proper uh, 
temperature and controls. Um, if you can't digitize right away, um, then you have to care for the avian material itself. Um, but the fact is that a lot of these materials are deteriorating and uh, time is not something that's on our side. Um, so I think the sooner the better, which is partly the idea of, of prioritizing some of your material. Okay, great. Um, so Selena from California had the question, just wanting to confirm what she was hearing was right. Um, and the question was, can you confirm that the two required wave chunks are the FMT and the data? And although BEXT is optional, that you think that that part's actually most important? Um, I would say, I mean, the FMT and data chunks are considered just part of the metadata standard that are mandatory. Um, it's true that uh, BEX chunk um, is considered to be part of the definition of those fields. So um, I guess it might be a little bit misrepresented here, but I would recommend all three. And um, let's see, I did have another question here I wanted to ask. Um, so are you going to touch on metadata a little bit more later? Because one of the questions was, is if you have a software that you would recommend for um, adding metadata to WAVE files. Sure. Um, I, I guess uh, there might be a little bit of confusion then. Um, a BEX chunk is referring to metadata fields. Um, so right now in a standard uh, broadcast wave file uh, that I'm discussing, these chunks are referring to different fields of metadata that can be added to the file. Okay. So, um, it's a way of breaking down uh, how metadata is attached to an audio file. Okay, great. Um, and then one more question, and then um, I do see a lot of questions coming in about um, video formats as well. And maybe those are questions that we can reserve for the very end since you are saying that you're going to focus mostly on the audio here. So just wanted to let people know that we're not missing their questions there. But um, the one question I did, did want to mention was, um, it was about RAID drives and wanting to know what you think of those potentially for storage. Um, we use a RAID drive uh, for some of our larger storage. Um, as I'm not uh, the IT department <laughs> at the studio, um, I am not quite as knowledgeable about uh, that element. Um, but we back things up to an LTO tape um, and use RAID drives for a large part of our storage since we have uh, so many projects coming in and out. I'll let you get back to it and certainly field more questions here at the end. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, moving forward, um, ID3 tags is another type of uh, metadata uh, similar to uh, what I was mentioning with the BEX chunk. Um, ID3 tags uh, are the most widely compatible. Um, it uh, has limits, though. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, I'm a, it looks like there uh, pardon me, there are several different versions of the tag implementation. Um, the metadata is embedded either at the beginning or the end of MP3 files, depending on the version. Um, it's not for certain types of files, like a WMA. 
as they each have their own tagging format. Um, this website is actually incorrect. I apologize, but on the resources page, um, this website went down. Uh, but on the resources page, you'll see uh, a connection to ID3 tags standards. Um, it's also sourceforage.net, um, and they will help kind of explain a little bit more about uh, what's involved with uh, this type of metadata attribution. Um, as I was saying before, uh, it's most widely compatible, um, but it's the least capable because it has limits of uh, characters and size. Um, there's lots of flavors of uh, ID3 tags. Um, there's uh, version 2, which is the most capable, but it's tricky to support. Um, its applications are not really responsible uh, with this type of uh, metadata. Um, often proprietary reasons are involved. Um, and so the transferring between uh, the material is a little difficult. So uh, 2.3 is the most popular uh, version used. It stores a tag at the beginning of a file. Um, 2.4 hasn't caught on yet as a successor, which stores at the end of the file. Um, So I guess just to kind of uh, drive the point home, uh, we, print, we worked with uh, Princeton University on a project um, where we were creating master files um, and streaming files from lectures. Uh, the data, the metadata they sent us was incomplete. And so as we were processing the audio, they asked us to get dates and info from the beginning of the lectures to import that data and then edit the date fields. Um, so when we sent them back uh, the audio files, uh, it turns out that they were seeing something different in the metadata. Uh, the, the dates were changing. So. Uh, the reason why that was happening is that we um, embedded the files with a program called LAME, which uh, embeds all four types of ID3 tags, um, which means that they couldn't communicate to each other. So different tools often look at different versions of um, metadata by default. Uh, and so it's something that you have to be aware of which tags are part of a file when you're embedding, um, which tags are involved with a file when you're editing, which tags are involved when you're playing back. Um, it's really an authority control problem and a versioning problem. So uh, it's just something to pay attention to. Um, so if you look at, uh, here's an example of uh, the different ways that you can see um, ID3 tags in iTunes uh, or RealPlayer, just the way that the um, metadata is displayed differently. Um, as you can see in iTunes, they use version 2.3. Um, RealPlayer uses a different version, um, which displays the information differently. So uh, I mean, recommendations is just to pick a version and use that version only. Um, just beware of using multiple tools to embed uh, metadata in files. You can take a look at uh, the resources link um, at the end uh, that I provided on ID3 tags for some more information. Um, Winamp is a Windows program that can be used to write and view both version 1 and version 2 ID3 tags. Um, ID3 version 2 is a command line tool for writing, extracting, and erasing version 1 and 2 tags. So another standard uh, that 
is is developed was developed by the Audio Engineering Society um, is the AES 57 2011. Um, it sets it was a standard that was set out to develop a vocabulary to describe both digital and analog audiovisual elements, which uses an extensible markup language. Um, it provides structured human readable document that is easily parsed and manipulated doing different using different tools. So it really just concerns the technical documentation or metadata for long term storage and preservation, um, linking the document to the physical objects. Uh, PB Core is the um, public broadcasting metadata dictionary project. Um, it was organized as a set of specific fields that can be used in database applications. Um, it utilizes as a data model for media cataloging and asset management systems. Uh, as a schema, it enables data exchange between media collection systems and organizations. Um, it was based on Dublin Core. Uh, version 2.0 was released in 2011, um, and it's a, it was uh, provided free with Creative Commons licensing. Um, interesting uh, application and uh, used as a standard in the field. Uh, so provides uh, metadata uh, standards. Uh, PB Core offers different elements of uh, metadata, as you can see by the represented in the map. Um, so I guess uh, maybe before moving on to uh, checksums, um, it looks like there are some curiosities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand how difficult it is to distill a complex topic into um, an hour and a half. So of course more questions are, are going to come up. Um, and I guess for those of us that, that might really end up um, maybe not doing this work ourselves, but outsourcing it to a company or work with our IT departments or other things like that to do this sort of work. Um, do you have any suggestions for some resources that, that we can turn to for how we can take a look at our own collections and try and assess what, what we need to do and some of the options for conversion so that we can go then when speaking with a vendor with our IT department kind of be more informed on that language? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I realize I, I sound like I'm talking in the uh, technical hierarchy of the uh, digitization world. Um, but most uh, vendors are, are really um, approachable. Um, you know, we often uh, act as a resource just to answer questions um, of things in this process. Um, there is a website. Um, I was just at an oral history conference, uh, and there's a project uh, called Oral History in the Digital Age. Um, and that, uh, if you want to check that out online, there are some resources for smaller institutions. Um, and ideas of what you can do in-house. Um, I think mainly, you know, if you're interested in the digitization process, it depends on the machinery. Um, you need to have the resource of the machinery uh, and essentially uh, equipment that will uh, convert your uh, analog materials to a digital format. Um, a lot of the elements of what I'm talking about uh, is essentially discussing the technical details of uh, metadata that we add on to files that can be embedded in files. Um, I think that it's something that's possible to do. Uh, you just need to, um, it's just learning about the process of it um, and having the amount of staff to devote to it. Um, 
essentially it takes time. Everything that's analog has to be processed in a real time um, to transfer to a digital format. Um, so our transfer engineers sit with the analog material from start to finish uh, to convert it to a digital format. I'm not sure if that helps to um, answer the question. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in addition to the resources and the ideas that you gave that in our chat box, other people are offering up a ton of great resources as well. So um, the other question along those same lines that I wanted to ask um, is also a lot of what I'm hearing you say is that you need to be consistent in what you're doing and to document what you're doing. Do you have any other kind of recommended resources for people that, that might want to look at developing a policy or a plan in relation to reformatting? You know, maybe some samples that they could look to? Um, sure. I mean, um, we do have uh, on our website a resource page um, that provides uh, an introduction to um, audio digitization and the processing of that. Um, I think that uh, there's quite a few. I could provide more resources for the website uh, for you guys after the course. Um, I'm sure that there's an extensive list that I could put up there of some places for you to go. That would be fantastic. And so I'm sure that might be easier than me listing them at the moment. <laughs> And I think people would them. really appreciate that afterwards. Um, and, and one question that always comes up when we are talking about these sorts of materials and the, the reason that we're really having to do all this conversion is because things become obsolete so, <laughs> so quickly. And so some people are saying that they're a little afraid to commit to you know, a one digital digitization format or technology, and then it becomes obsolete so quickly. Um, and is there anything that we can kind of do to kind of prepare ourselves for this or, or make it easier down the line? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, the expectation is uh, that, um, you know, the idea of digital preservation is that technology and media will change. Um, so being able to role with the changes is important. Um, migration becomes a way of life. So you're going to have to take into account that you will need to um, continue to convert files down the road. Um, I guess it's partly why you know we recommend to keep things simple, um, keep with machines that um, process things in, in the correct way, and then using uh, consistent um, software programs throughout, like as I was discussing with the ID3 tag versioning issue, um, um, that's something to be considered. And I think migration is the main point, uh, except that migration is a part of uh, preservation. Which is so hard for us as preservation people to yes. <laughs> truly embrace. You know, we would love to just put things in a box and have it be be done, and not necessarily think about it as this continual process. So it's a change of mindset on on all set sides, I think, in some respects. So, well, and there's the idea. Um, I mean, uh, digital uh, preservation is a bit of a different concept. Uh, digital is not for ever and I mean as things are um, you know we look at analog material it has a particular lifespan uh, there are some uh, for example some glass discs that we've received that we are unable to process because they have deteriorated so badly so I think that the idea of digitizing material is um, to save it before it's gone um, and speaking to the content, I guess a lot of the technical details of what I'm discussing um, is, you know, we take processes, complex processes like this in the transfer process uh, to ensure that um, we are tr giving as true of a representation uh, as 
the original, um, what was originally recorded, um, because we're not here to edit it or change it. We're here to preserve it. Um, and so I think that's the idea of sticking with a lot of these standards that have been developed in the field um, and that we use here at the studio. Great. So we have a little less than 20 minutes left, so I'll you know, hold any more questions until, um, until we're at the end. OK. Um, so I guess uh, moving forward to uh, a checksum formula, um, we have, uh, if you can take a look at <laughs> what's on the slide here, um, looks extremely complex and uh, a bunch of mumble jumbo. This is essentially uh, what a checksum algorithm looks like now. This isn't something that we would be passing on to your end, um, but this is the technical data integrity of a file. So essentially, um, after we process, uh, after we take, for example, an analog reel and convert it through an analog to digital converter, which is connected to the computer, which is using the software program that is creating the digital file, um, the checksum formula is essentially an algorithm that we run that compares the first file uh, to the last file. So um, if you even uh, we can use this uh, mathematical equation as an example. Um, if you change one digit uh, in in the algorithm, uh, this is a mathematical representation of an algorithm. If uh, you change one digit in the value, um, you can see how it changes the end result. Um, now, I point to this because uh, a change of a, sing a single digit in a chat sum uh, gives a very different value. It isn't subtle. Um, so the probability uh, of having there, there are 3.4 times 10 to the 38th possible values um, that can be created in a checksum al algorithm. So. The point of the checksum is to compare the two. It's just simply pure math uh, behind the file. And um, the chance of two different files having the same checksum is essentially uh, does not happen. <laughs> um, there are three different major types of checksums. Uh, there is an MD5, uh, which is a message digest. Uh, a SHA-1 and a SHA-256. Now these are um, technical terms, but essentially it's a 128-bit 128 bit value uh, that's converted to hex to make it easier for humans to read. So at the bottom example, you'll see that is what uh, the complicated algorithm that I showed before, that is how it's represented um, in hex with 32 place values. So for example, then when you're looking at a file after it has been transferred, um, we attribute a checksum to that file uh, to highlight its uniqueness. So if we're looking at it in binary, um, that would be what the checksum algorithm would look like, whereas hex is much uh, easier to read and compare. So if you were to change one value, it would completely change the checksum. So basically, that's essentially saying looking at the data integrity of a digital file, uh, if any element is changed in that file, it will be a new unique file. Um, so it's just the checksum is a way to highlight that this is the one and only version of this file. So I guess um, some conclusions, I would um, just say that uh, it's important that to note that there's really no magic solutions. Um, vendors are here to help, and uh, we're all in this field um, trying to 
preserve um, material together. So the idea of digital preservation is just, you know, we use established tools, um, upgrade cautiously, and just realize that uh, every solution is temporary, but it's um, something that uh, steps that often have to be taken uh, in order so that we don't lose the content that is on the um, analog original. Um, so I know that was um, an overview of a lot of really technical things that um, might have sounded complicated and, and confusing. Um, I'd be happy to answer more questions. Sure. Always glad when there's time for a few more questions. Um, and I'm going to try and keep them a little bit more, more general, um, because we did have some very specific questions in there as well. But um, one of them is we were talking about audio the, throughout all of this, and we did get a lot of questions about are there standards for video preservation, and um, where might some folks turn for that? Although this might be another opportunity to add more more links on the website a little bit later. But if there's any insight you have into that, I'm sure people would appreciate it. Sure. I mean, um, I can certainly provide some more resources online um, for looking at video preservation as well. Um, right now, uh, I think uh, the standards for uh, Video are uh, still being developed um, at the moment. There, uh, my uh, George Blood, um, I, the president of our company, he is working with the Library of Congress uh, to write a um, white paper on uh, digitization standards for video preservation, which um, highlights. Uh, Essentially, a lot of the standards that I'm talking about are the technical details of the back end of how we're processing things to ensure that it um, as, adheres as closely to the original um, representation of that material. Uh, so the standards for video preservation are quite extensive, but they're still being developed. Um, you know, I guess uh, uh, we're learning about this process as we go. Um, and uh, but the Library of Congress would be a good place to start. Um, they have a lot of resources on their website. Uh, and then I'll certainly provide um, more links to um, uh, an overview for uh, video preservation and some different resources that you can look online. Um, it might be easier just to provide a list of links um, after the webinar for people to reference on their own time. Great. Um, so I think Marsha in Northern California had a, a really interesting and good question, maybe a bit more um, theoretical in nature. But she was asking for what your opinion is, what do you see as the next method for preservation after digital? Is there something coming up that we should all be on our toes for? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that, uh, you, you know, at the you. moment, I think we're just looking to use the resources that we have um, with the amount of knowledge that we have and share um, share the knowledge that we have uh, within the community. I think, you know, a large part of preservation is about access and about the conversation and uh, you know, especially being able to do things like this where, you know, I can see throughout the entire time that I've been uh, presenting, you know, people are exchanging ideas and links and uh, helpful uh, processes of how things are done at their particular institution. And I think those ideas, I think the more that we talk to each other in that sense, uh, the better we'll able to, um, you know, exchange these ideas and, and help support uh, preserving uh, intellectual material. Yeah, great. And uh, Marcia just commented again that she's heard of DNA computers as well as light beams, which I just can't even um, wrap my head around <laughs> wow. those sorts of things. So um, that is really all the, the questions that, that we have right now. Um, so I can throw things back to you, Jenny. 
Sure, yeah, let me go ahead and put up the assignment. Um, if you were feeling a little lost, don't worry, it's the evaluation. So, so it should be pretty easy to fill out. Um, and let's see, I have the link to the course webpage. And then again, as always, if you're watching in a group, um, just ask that your group leader write down everyone who's watching with them so we have a better idea of everyone who's with us today. And it looks like, I'm going to give this a few minutes uh, for our group folks to post their names in so you've just got like a few more seconds to throw in any last minute questions for Stephanie. And we'll just give that a few minutes. And I'd also, I mean, um, I can, I think, is my uh, contact information online too, I would uh, gladly, you know, accept questions over email if people want to ask things about specific uh, projects that they have um, or, you know, want help with um, ideas for resources for things, um, you know, after providing the links online. But also um, people can feel free to contact me here at the studio. And we also have lots of uh, very intelligent transfer engineers that um, work with these technical processes every day. So it does look like we have one last minute question from Catherine. Uh, she's curious, any thoughts on AIFF first wave for audio files? Um, I think that uh, to be honest, um, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that. Um, I suppose uh, AIFF, I think, um, potentially is a is it a proprietary format, um, and Wave uh, is more adaptable. Uh, I think AIFF is specifically for Mac, um, which I think you can run into some issues uh, when you have a file format that is. Uh, proprietary, um, just in terms of uh, transfer conversion and the, using things between different um, computers. Okay. Well, um, in addition, um, folks can feel free to email our info at heritagepreservation.org. I've also posted my email, and um, we can forward your questions along to Stephanie if anything comes up. Uh, and again, keep an eye on the website. I've been tracking all of your fantastic links, and Stephanie has more links to give me uh, for resources. So do go back to the web page. I will uh, attempt to add those as quickly as possible. So it looks like uh, we are done. Again, uh, the deadline for all that homework assignment is one week from today, November 6th. Um, thank you all so much for uh, logging in and coming with us over the past couple of weeks. Um, and I have to thank all of our speakers who aren't necessarily here right now. You were all fantastic. And Stephanie, you were fantastic as well. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I appreciate you all attending my session. Yeah, and also CCAHA, thank you guys so much. And thank you, Laura, for being on board to help us with all those questions. Great. It's been a pleasure working with you. All right, everyone. Have a fantastic afternoon and a, a happy Halloween. <laughs>